Gospel of Mark, we're in chapter 12. I'm going to call this a busy Tuesday. It's really astonishing to realize this whole string of debates in Mark, uh, in the following verses, all took place in one busy day, Tuesday of the what some people call the Passion Week. Now, the first of these series we took last time, but the uh, that Lord, the source of authority. Then we now we have the parable of the vineyard, the husbandman, uh, about taxation, the resurrection, what is the greatest commandment, the Messiah's relationship to David, and an account of the widow's gift of the two mites. And so obviously the bulk of these occur in chapter 12. But we took the source of the Lord's authority last time, and we'll take these seven as we review this chapter. So uh, in chapter 11, of course, the cursing of the fig tree, which of course is a symbol of Israel, and its unfruitfulness, uh, and that also, in, and the cleansing of the temple and so forth, um, led to a challenge by the official guardians of the law, the members of the Sanhedrin. And... Uh, Jesus had them off balance, of course, from his responses to their challenges. So he now takes the initiative with a parable drawn from very familiar images in the Old Testament. You'll find these images in Psalm 80, but very specifically the first seven verses of Isaiah uh, chapter 5. And uh, so anyway, Mark chapter 12, verse 1, And he began to speak unto them by parables. A certain man planted a vineyard, and he set a hedge about it, and digged a place for the wine fat, built a tower, let it out to the husbandman, and went into a far country. So he's an absentee owner here, isn't he? The vineyard. Now we learned last time, this is a vineyard, uh, is a symbol, for, as a national symbol for Israel. And that, of course, comes out of the, the, the key to that, because we hear Israel related to a fig tree, to a vine, to a... a uh, 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 a number of things. And so, uh, but if we get all that from Judges 9. Jotham has a parable, which includes an olive tree, which of course is characterized by the valuableness of its oil. Uh, the fig tree, which gives you sweet fruit. So it, the idea of fig tree is to bear fruit. And the vine, of course, is wine. And the bramble bush is good for nothing. No fruit, it's only good as fuel to the fire. Each one of these four uh, Jotham uses in his parable, and we discover by in inspection that the use of these idioms for Israel always reflect a certain aspect of Israel. And the olive tree is uh, ge genealogically its source. The fig tree, it's, it's a political term, really. And uh, vine is spiritual with the wine and so forth. And bramble is the world's empire, or Satan's empire, if you will. And the cursing of the fig tree, of course, deals with the fact it was not bearing fruit. So the curse of that was uh, focused, uh, Jesus' way of focusing attention on that. So as far as politics concerned, I love to throw in this <coughs> quote of politics from Ambrose Bierce, uh, a strife of interests masquerading as a contest of principles. That's politics. The conduct of public affairs for private advantage. It's another <laughs> definition. So it's this typical Ambrose's cynicism that reflects there, but I, I enjoy that. Anyway. We also notice the concept of expositional constancy, a fancy term simply meaning that the Holy Spirit tends to use similar idioms all through the, the 66 books of the Bible. The olive, the fig tree, the vine, the bramble, these four are used consistently for Israel all through the scripture. But each one has a, uh, focuses on a particular nuances. We find soils, birds, mustard seed, Matthew 13, used consistent with a consistency that tr transcends each individual parable. And uh, the woman in Revelation 13, and, uh, and also in Revelation 2, Jezebel, is a consistent use of idiom. The rock that followed them, Paul identifies 1 Corinthians 10, 4, the rock that in the wilderness wanderings it represented Christ. The stone cut without hands in Daniel 2, the stone the builders rejected in Matthew 21, the chief cornerstone all through the Old Testament passage. Again, a consistency with the rock, the stone, and so forth. That's what we, we collectively uh, ascribe that to what's called expositional constancy. Well, the vineyard is the subject at hand. The very temple in which Jesus was standing featured a richly carved grapevine, 70 cubits high. You know, that's over 100 feet high. A sculpted around the door which led from the porch to the holy place. The branches, the tendrils, the leaves were of gold. The branches hanging upon them were costly jewels. Impressive stuff. Herod had first placed it there 
and rich and patriotic Jews had continued to add to its embellishment. So this was very elegant. And uh, the Maccabean coins also that uh, bore the same symbols of, of the of vineyard symbols. So Jesus is using phrases here directly from the song of the vineyard in Isaiah 5. Very familiar to all of them. And, uh, and uh, just as with Israel, how didst thou drive out the heathen with thy hand, plants them to, and plants them, how did, thou didst flick the people and cast them out? These are passages. We, we, we uh, farm a far richer vineyard than any, the ancient Israel. Because more than the prophets, we have the whole word of God and the indwelling spirit. And we also have the testimony of the saints over the last 2,000 years. And Luke deals with that. But let's take a look at Isaiah 5, the first seven verses, to get a flavor. This is a passage that would be very familiar to the, 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 uh, the, the, the Jewish community at that time. Now, Isaiah says, Now will I sing to my beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. My well-beloved hath a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. He fenced it. He gathered out the stones thereof. He planted it with the choices of, the choicest vine. He built a tower in the midst of it and also made a wine press therein. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes, that it brought forth wild grapes. Oh, now inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, betwixt me and my vineyard. What could I have done more to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, brought it forth wild grapes. And now go to, I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away the hedge thereof, and it shall be eaten up, and I'll break down the wall thereof, and it shall be trodden down, and I will lay it waste. It shall not be pruned nor digged, and there shall come up briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah his pleasant plan. And he looked for judgment, but behold, oppression, for righteousness, but behold, a cry. So Jesus is speaking to them in parables. And he uses that same idiom there. Man planted a vineyard, set a hedge about it, digged a place. You see the parallel. It's obviously lifted from that Isaiah passage. Put a hedge about it. A hedge, what it really, it's used here in the sense of a fence. It could have been a stone or wall for that matter. And the wine fat is a place, that's the pit or trough beneath the wine press for the purpose of catching the results of the, the, the juice, the result of the fruit. And of course the tower is a combination of watchtower and storage place, both. Next verse, and at the season he sent to the husbandman a servant that he might receive from the husbandman of the fruit of the vineyard. It's his vineyard, he's entitled to get its fruit. And they caught him and beat him and sent him away empty. Wow, it's not, that's no way to treat a representative of the landlord, is it? And again he sent unto them another servant. And at him they cast stones and wounded him in the head and sent him away shamefully handled. And uh, break his head is the way the Wycliffe <laughs> translates it. And again, he sent another, and him they killed, and many others, beating some and killing some. Wow. See, uh, incidentally, normally a farmer could not even use the fruit until the fifth year because of his thing. But in order to retain his legal rights to the property, the owner had to receive produce from the tenants, even if it was only some of the vegetables that grew between the rows of the trees of the vines. That was the law. So if he didn't get, he would go into latches, as the lawyers would say. In other words, if he didn't get that fruit, he would, forfeit, he, he would uh, abandon his title. And so that explains why the tenants refused to give him anything. They wanted to claim the vineyard for themselves. It also explains why the owner continued to send agents to them. It was a question of authority and ownership, not just the fruit. And uh, that's what's being challenged here. So the analogy to Israel is no exaggeration. Elijah was given into the wilderness by the monarchy. Isaiah was sawn in half, according to tradition, and it's hinted at in Hebrews 11. Zechariah was stoned to death near the altar. John the Baptist was beheaded. See, these all can be viewed as uh, uh, servants of the owner. And they're treating it there. So you can see, can you see the parallelism? And, this, and the whole summary of all this is in Hebrews 11, verses 37 and 38. Moving on here, though. Verse 6 of uh, Mark 12. Having yet therefore one son, his well-beloved, he sent him also last unto them, saying, They will reverence my son. But those husbandmen said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance shall be ours. 
Well, beloved, now this, these words obviously are increasing the parallelism between the parable and, of course, the role of Jesus Christ. He came unto his own, his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons. John opens his gospel, verse 11, the first chapter, with that very uh, expression. And, uh, and of course, John 3, 16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So there we are. And the plot to kill him was a description of the scheming that at that very time was, uh, to, was to put Jesus to death. We've already covered that, right? Okay. And they took him and killed him and cast him out of the vineyard. So verse, verses 2 through 5 covers the three years when the fruit was not used. Then it was in the fourth year that the beloved son was sent. And this is the year when the fruit was devoted to the Lord, according to Leviticus 19. And that's when they killed him. And three and a half, he was in three, three and a half years. If the tenants could do away with the heir, they would have clear claim to the property, so they cast him out and killed, uh, killed him. And that's also alluded to in Hebrews 13. So they're willing to kill to accomplish their evil purpose. And uh, so Jesus says, Okay, what shall therefore the Lord of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the husbandman and will give the vineyard unto others. So in answering this, they condemned themselves. The prediction that the owner would destroy the husband was fulfilled in AD 70. Jerusalem fell and the temple was destroyed. And uh, when the Romans under Titus, you know, destroyed Jerusalem and put a very, a very end to any semblance of self-rule, which the Jew had previously enjoyed. And I'll give the vineyard unto others. Now the others... Uh, it seems to, as further described in Matthew's gospel, where Jesus is quoted as saying as follows, verse, Matthew 21, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. This is one of those strange allusions which describes what we would call the church as a nation. Okay? And so, uh, and of course the term, as we use the term church, we're speaking of the mystical church, the body of believers. We're not talking about church buildings, obviously. And so this is an obvious reference to the Gentiles and the church in a collective sweep here. Have you not read the scripture, the stone which the builders rejected has become the head of the corner? That's a quote from Psalm 118. And that's the same psalm that they're going to quote when he's riding the donkey, because it's a few verses later that it deals with the king presenting himself uh, for, officially. But um, the stone is a well-known idiom for the Messiah. We talk, as again, this pr principle of expositional constancy at work. We see that stone in Exodus 17 and Daniel 2. The stone cut without hands that smites the image and it crumbles, you know, the, that whole uh, image there in Daniel 2, Zechariah 4. And all through the New Testament, Romans 9, 1 Corinthians 10, 1 Peter 2. Perhaps the most conspicuous use of this as a figure of speech by Paul in 1 Corinthians 10.4. The rock that followed them in the wilderness was Christ. And that's very poignant because he's, the rock gets struck, it, it gets, produces water twice. First time when it struck, the second time he was not supposed to strike it, he did, and for that reason, Moses did not inherit, strangely enough. And so at, at Meribah. And so we compare Exodus 17.6 versus Numbers 20, and you get into that whole discussion. Now, the Hebrew Midrashic view is that prophecy is not simply prediction and fulfillment. That's the Western model. You and I have the Greek mentality that prophecy is a prediction and it's fulfillment. In the Hebrew mind, prophecy is pattern, not just prediction. And that's why the Jewish uh, commentaries are so preoccupied with the pattern of the year, the pattern of the history of the nation in, in Messianic terms. See, back there in, at, at Meribah, if Moses had specifically followed the Lord's instructions, the two events would have prefigured the two comings of Christ. The first time when he's smitten, and the second time when he produced the water without being smitten. And so he, it, it, Moses un, unknowingly punctured the model that God was setting up. And so God means what he says and says what he means. Anyway, continuing here, verse 11, this was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Jesus was God's ultimatum, in other words. And they sought to lay hold on him, but feared the people, for they knew that he had spoken the parable against them. 
and they left him and went their way. They were really f frustrated, the leadership, because they realized they weren't stupid. They realized the parallel he was drawing had to do with them. That's not as some kind of obscure contrivance. That was clearly the intent of, of using that as, a, as a, an illumination, if you will. But they couldn't, they didn't want, they didn't want to have an uprising. And that also consistent with the other passages point out that they planned to take him, to kill him, but not on, a, not on a feast day. They didn't want to have an uproar. That would get the Romans on their back. And so uh, it occurred on Passover because Jesus made sure it did. Anyway, they sent unto him certain of the Pharisees and of the Herodians to catch him in his words. Now this phrase itself is pretty surprising because the Herodians and the Pharisees were opposites. The Pharisees were very legalistic, keeping to the law, very, very Jewish, if I can express it that way. The Herodians were Jews who were sympathizing, sympathizers with uh, their conquerors. They were, they were Hellenizers. They, they, they adopted things that were Greek. Uh, Her, uh, Herod was not Jewish. He was an Edomian, a, a, actually ethnically from the line that represented uh, Israel's enemies. So the Herodians... Were, were the sympathizers. They were, the, uh, they, they were uh, um, accommodating their conquerors. And uh, so the Pharisees... Uh, and, but here's the, you find these two traditional enemies joining because they both had a mutual goal to get this, um, this usurper out of the way here. So a common threat had forced two traditional enemies to unite. The Pharisees, they're the nationalistic legalists, if you will, and the Herodians, which are the sold-out liberals, if you will, okay, to use that, describe it that way. The former were unalterably opposed to any foreign overlordship, while the latter were supporters of the foreign government of the Herods, appointed by Rome, ethnically of their enemies, but further than that, appointed by the, the, the Romans. And so you find these two groups joining in their attack. And the Herodians supported the, the family of Herod as well as the Romans who gave them the power to rule. The Pharisees considered Herod, the Herod clan to be evil usurpers of the throne of David. Herod was an Edomite. He was not even Jewish. People missed that, you see. And the Pharisees... Uh, um, and by the way, it's important to understand that. During the Maccabean revolt, when the Maccabeans finally got the yoke of Greek, Greece off their back and they were self-ruling, they indulged in forced conversions to Judaism. If you were an Idumean, an Edomite, you, uh, living in their land, you had to become Jewish. You had to swear, you had to go through a, a procedure. It was just as forceful and just as inappropriate as the, the Inquisition did the other way around under the medieval church, if you will. And so, uh, so you need to understand that because even today, there are rabbis that regard the globalists, these powerful people who are trying to move towards the global government, they call them Edomites. Now, where, where did that come from? Well, because they regard them as equivalent to the... They see people who we would regard as Jewish as non-Jews. Example is Roosevelt. You think it's a Jewish name, but it's not. It's a, they look at it as, a, as a, those that are, say they are Jews and are not. And, uh, or, the, uh, or even the, the house of Rothschild. It's not Rothschild, it's Rothschild, Red Shield. And it's the seal, the red is the symbol of the Edomites. And so there are some that believe that the Rothschild family goes back to Edom. Not Ju they're really not Jewish. They masquerade as Jewish. That would be the view of the adversaries. So I mention that because, first of all, it'll give you understanding if you encounter that uh, 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 attitude among certain rabbinically oriented people. Uh, also, it may be a clue as to what may be embraced in the Revelation, where twice it refers to those that say they are Jews and are not. And uh, so, for what it's worth. Anyway, the Pharisees also opposed the poll tax that the Romans had inflicted on Judea. And uh, they resented the very presence of Rome anywhere in their land. And that, was, that, that tension was uh, uh, focused... Even worse than the Pharisees, there's another group called the Zealots. They were actually open rebellions. And, and uh, so well, we encountered some of them at the cross. And when they were come, they say unto him, Master, we know that thou art true, and carest for no man. For thou regardest not the person of men, but teachest the way of God in truth. 
Can you see their mouth dripping with this flattery? You know, hypocrisy, of course. So having set that as sort of their opening statement, you know, we know that you're true and you care for no man and, and you regard not the person of man and you teach the way of God and truth. Is it lawful to give tribute to Caesar or not? But they thought they were hoisting him here on his own petard, if you will, because no matter which way he answers, he's going to lose. If he says they're going to give tribute to Caesar, that's going to alienate the, the, the nationalists. If he says you shouldn't give tribute, that's going to make him guilty of a crime. So they thought they had him caught here. And uh, after this insincere flattery, there's, there's a subtle trap here. They assumed he'd have to, uh, no matter how he answers, either offend the Jewish population or offend the Roman leadership. And here comes the, what, what is the, uh, ins shall we give or shall we not give? You see, the money is a symbol of who you're yielding authority to. But he, knowing their hypocrisy, said to them, Why tempt ye me? Bring me a penny that I may see it. A penny, a coin, in other words, a denarius. It's a day's wage, basically. A small silver coin, about 3.8 grams. And I'll be just to give you a feeling for here, uh, I, I meant to get a photograph of one. I forgot to do that. But on one side, it bore the head of Caesar. And abbreviate information, Tiberius Caesar, son of divine Augustus. Augustus. And uh, so uh, the reverse was inscribed, Pontifex Maximus which means chief priest, by the way, and that's still the title of the Pope today, Pontifex Maximus, as an aside. And that's in contrast, of course, to what the New Testament calls for. Anyway, they brought it, and he said to them, well, whose is this image and superscription? They said to him, Caesar's. Jesus answering said to them, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. He slipped through their little trap. This is often quoted, but only half quoted. Everybody remembers that he said, whose image at Caesar will render under Caesar things that are Caesar's. It doesn't end there, because the, the, the flip side of all of this is, in whose image are you? In God's image. Well, then render to God the things that are God's. See, that's, that's completing the thought. The thought has two, two sides. Just like a coin has two sides, the thought has two sides. Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's. But whose image are you made? See, they all knew, the Jew knew, of course, from, from uh, Genesis chapter 1, from the Torah. Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. That's an astonishing reply. Some have regarded this as the single most influential political statement ever made in the history of the world. There are papers written that take that view. That, there's, that, that this is... So fundamental. Render, we, we is uh, a padamoti, it's uh, to pay a debt, to pay back, if you will. Coinage, you see, is regarded as the property of the government that minted it. They're already accepting Caesar's authority or they would not be using his money. So they may not like it, but they were accepting his authority by the very use of his money. The state is a valid institution even when it is controlled by a man who thinks he is God. And I wasn't making any reference to any immediate history of our own. It's a broad, encompass encompassing statement. Now you and I are being created in the image of God. We are under God's authority as well. We should keep those distinct. He has total ownership of us all. Now, when you get into the study of the Federal Reserve, this is particularly interesting because the Federal Reserve is neither federal nor a reserve. It's a private bank. That it's got itself in the position of printing the money and renting it to you for interest. Very strange. That's against con unconstitutional, by the way. Anyway, we're in a unique predicament here. And you and I are in a unique predicament because we are in a representative republic which places the responsibility on our shoulders. Our government are our employees. That's it, or at least was until recently. And I express the personal view that I believe you and I are going to be held accountable before the throne of God for our stewardship of our present mandate, which has come to us at such an incredibly high price. Every time you pass by a military cemetery, realize that it's filled with the bodies of patriots 
who died fighting everything that our current administration stands for. Moving on. Then come unto him the Sadducees. Now here's the third group. We talk about the Pharisees, the Herodians. Then come unto him the Sadducees. Now these are what you and I would call the liberals. They did not believe in supernatural. They say there's no resurrection. That's one of the, the not the only, but the, one of the defining, doctrine, defining doctrines. They are probably parallel to, in our world, uh, to an agnostic that's liberal in his political position. Okay. We say there's no resurrection. They ask him, saying, now these guys are going to trap him another way, they think. The Sadducees. And by the way, this is the only place in Mark where the Sadducees are mentioned. That's not why they're sad, you see. No, they're sad, they're sad you see, because they don't believe in a resurrection. That's why they're sad, you see. And I, th that, that horrible homonym is just a way of remembering, which is, you know, it, it, it's corny, but it reminds you where they fit, okay? So, in no, by the way, nowhere in the record is it recorded that I've been able to find that any of these so-called liberals ever came to faith. Many of the priests and Pharisees did. That's recorded in the book of Acts. But uh, no, no, I think that's interesting. But uh, Sadducees did not believe in the existence of the soul, life after death, the resurrection, the final judgment, angels or demons. Those are all things that the Sadducees uh, rejected. But they did, strangely enough, accept the Torah, the books of Moses. And uh, most of them were very wealthy. They were religious autocrats, aristocrats, if you will. Josephus, in, in, the Jew, in his book of the, Jewish, the Wars of the Jews, said the Sadducees are even among themselves rather bourge in their behavior and in their intercourse with their peers are a, a rude as, are as rude as aliens. And that's a Jewish writer, historian, recording it that way. Moving on to verse 19. So the Sadducees are saying, Master, Moses wrote unto us, If a man's brother die and leave his wife behind him and leave no children, that his brother should take his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. And indeed it does, by the way. This is in Deuteronomy 25. It deals with the, what's called the Leverite marriage. It comes from, not, it's nothing, not, not Levitical marriage, Leverite. Lever is a term meaning a husband's brother, strangely. And so the practice of, it was the requirement of a marriage of a widow to the brother of her deceased husband. This custom was practiced in ancient Jew, Jewish society and is still practiced, by the way, in parts of Africa today, interestingly enough. But they take this hypothetical situation out of the Torah, because that was something they uh, had some knowledge of. And then they continue. So now there were seven brethren. The first took a wife, and dying left no seed. The second took her and died. Neither left he no, any seed. And the third likewise. And the seven had her and left no seed. Last of all, the woman finally died also. In the resurrection, therefore, when they shall rise, whose wife shall she be of them? For the seven had her to wife. Now, I think some of you realize this probably has a practical application in Hollywood today, but I don't think that's the thought here. Okay, okay. <laughs> I'm being facetious and flippant, of course. I do believe in the spiritual gifts. Mine is flippancy. Anyway. <laughs> well, Jesus answering said to him, Do ye not therefore err, because ye know not the Scriptures, neither the power of God? They were ignorant in two different areas. They didn't know their own Scriptures. They claimed the Torah, but they didn't understand it. And the power, the, or nor did they understand the power of God. Because Jesus continued, For they shall rise from the dead, uh, no, excuse me, the angels which are, but, the, are he said, but they shall rise from the dead when they shall neither marry nor given in marriage, but are as the angels which are in heaven. In verse 25. Now there's a lot of confusion that comes from this verse, by the way. Uh, he doesn't indicate that fallen angels could not meddle with women. By the way, I wouldn't withhold any technology from an angel that was bent on mischief. And so uh, it says that the angels in heaven don't marry. Why? Because they don't procreate. They don't die. Angels are, there's, there's no procedure to procreate. That doesn't mean that Satan, and for his purposes, didn't contrive to accomplish his objective with the strange goings on in Genesis 6. There are many pastors that have a difficulty with the so-called angel view of Genesis 6 because of this verse. And uh, I got an interesting note from Tim LaHaye uh, some months ago, because he was sort of a holdout on that view. He didn't quite you know, accept our rendering of Genesis. He finally wrote me a note and said, Chuck, I give up. I think you're right. 
He finally caved in. Be but he was stumbling because of this verse, because angels don't marry, doesn't mean they can't somehow contrive mischief with human, to, to create the hybrids of Genesis 6, which is what that's all about. And what Genesis 6 is all about is confirmed at least twice, maybe three times, in the New Testament. Second Peter 2, 4, and Jude v verses 5 and 6 confirm the angel view of Genesis 6, by the way. So that's a whole other study. I don't want to derail this discussion going through that all again, but I encourage you to understand what really happened in Genesis 6, because it's essential to understand that, not only for eschatological reasons, end times, but also just to understand the Old Testament, because that those, those events were not confined to just the events before the flood of Noah. They occur in a similar fashion subsequently, and that's why Joshua is instructed when he conquers the land to wipe out men, women, and children of certain tribes because there was a gene pool problem there again. But there's a whole background there to get into if you want to get into it. There are, there's a word that occurs only twice in the scripture, in the Greek, okaterion. In 2 Corinthians 5, 2, it refers to the heavenly resurrection body that you and I aspire to getting when we get into our resurrection body. It's, all, it's called the okaterion. It's all that word also occurs in Jude 6 as the habitation that the fallen angels disrobed from. What does all that mean? Don't know. But it's a, for a discussion of this and the role of fallen angels in 6 and the, and the errors of the commonly taught fallacies of the line of Seth and all that, we have a briefing back called The Return of the Nephilim or also published a book called Alien Encounters that I invite you to, to explore. The same God that created the angels is able to give us new bodies we will need for the new life in heaven. And he'll deal with that then. But anyway, Jesus continues, And as touching the dead that they rise, have ye not read in the book of Moses? He's talking to the Sadducees who accept the Torah. See? Have ye not read in the book of Moses how in the bush God spake unto him, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. That's a very important statement. And he's, he's drawing this from Exodus. He says that it comes from Exodus 3, verse 6. See, that question de demand it's, it's structured in a, by grammatically that it requires an affirmative answer. That's what we call a rhetorical question. And uh, for Christ knew well the Sadducees were thoroughly familiar with the Pentateuch. He's specifically referring to Exodus 3, verse 6, but interestingly, he's quoting it from the Greek translation, the Septuagint. Most of the quotes in the New Testament, when they're quotes from the Old Testament, are taken from the Greek translation of the Old Testament that was done three centuries before Christ's ministry. That's very provocative if you're studying manuscripts to realize he's quoting from the, from the Greek. See, so, but Jesus nails this one from Exodus 3, verse 6. Notice he didn't use the past tense. He says, I am the God of Abraham and so forth. Origin, I think, in the second century, he pointed out that it's ridiculous for God to say that he is a God of men who have no existence. He's the God of people who were alive. See? The patriarchs were alive when those words were spoken. The Torah does thus teach that there is life after death. Many people don't realize that. The Sadducees certainly didn't realize that. So that's he's attacking their disbelief in life after death from the very text that they claim they accept. Do you follow the subtlety there? Many people miss that after reading this here. Because he's drawing from the Torah, but the issue he's focusing on is that the Torah does teach us life after death, because Jesus is, the God is speaking, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You see? The covenant promises were eternal, is the point. And the Hebrews 11, of course, really develops this for you. Moving on. He is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. Ye therefore do greatly err. Jesus is straightening these guys out. See, the Sadducees, they were the liberals of their day. They did not know either the scripture or the power of God. What about you and me? What about you and me? Do we really understand the scripture? Do we really understand the power of God? The resurrection is the signature of my soul. The resurrection of Christ, that empty tomb, is what validated the sacrifice that was made three days earlier. The Torah, by the way, is replete with other examples likewise. Adam was created ex nihilo, created out of 
He's a, he was a proto-resurrection. His first, first creation is like a resurrection. Enoch was raptured, not subject to death. Abraham's offer of Isaac is imbued with the resurrection of Isaac. You discover that, that, Jesus, that um, Abraham was saved because he believed in the resurrection of Isaac. God, you promised he's going to have children. You want me to kill him? Then it's your problem, not mine. Because I know he's got to be raised from the dead in order to have the children you promised. And, and that's not a contrivance. Hebrews 11.19 points out that Abram received him in a figure. And uh, Israel's deliverance is all through the scripture. The Red Sea, the manna, the quail, the water. Uh, all the life-giving power are examples that, of, of the Torah teaching uh, life after death. But moving on. And one of the scribes came and having heard them reasoning together and perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? Now this apparently is a sincere question. This wasn't his buddies that were trying to trap Christ in a game here. One of the scribes, having heard them reasoning together and perceiving that he had answered them well, answered, which is the first commandment of all? And this is a scribe who, is this, in other words, he was also a Pharisee. The scribes, you understand, had determined, you find Jewish Talmudic scholars argue that there's 613 precepts in the law. 365 negative ones and 248 positives. Those 613 they regard as 613 commandments as such. Okay. And one of their common exercises is discussing which of these is the greatest. Okay. So Jesus answered and said, first of all, uh, 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 first of all, uh, the commandments is, and then he, Jesus is quoting the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the, word, the Lord our God is one Lord. Hear, O Israel, in Hebrew it's Shema. Hear. The O Israel is a, is a, is a, lingua, is a structural addition, but the, the, these are the familiar words of the Shema. This great confession of faith is quoted by the pious morning and evening, and when you go through any Jewish door, post, you'll see a little mezuzah, a little container that has some scripture in it, inside it. And they touch it or kiss it as they go by. Every threshold in a hotel or in an office building or in a home has a little mezuzah. It's always a little, it's never quite vertical. It's off, it's always off a little bit. And uh, they adore virtually all the uh, Jewish doorposts. And I might add, it's also the capstone engraving on our logo for the Institute. And uh, if you've seen the Institute's medallion, bronze, silver, gold medallions. Um, the Berean Challenge, Acts 1711, is what been our trademark for four decades. Um, then around it, in Greek, is 1 Corinthians 13:12. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. So that core inside is sort of the New Testament expression. It's set in the Star of David, and then wrapped around the outside edge is the Shema, going, of course, um, from right to left, in effect. And uh, so that's the Shema, the greatest commandment. And that's what Jesus is making reference to here. What does it say in Hebrew? Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment, the greatest commandment, in other words. And by the way, these are words we use so sloppily. What do we mean by the heart? Do you mean that organ that pumps our blood? No, not really. We use that idiomatically, don't we? I love you with all my heart. I'm not talking about my organ, it's talking about something else. But it's more than the mind. It's somehow involved. What is the soul? All kinds of people have different definitions for the soul. And the mind. Is the mind the brain? No, no, no. Any physiologist will tell you it's far more than that. And uh, so the, certainly the, mind, the, the, the brain is part of that. That's why you make, the, you, you make certain decisions from the gut. You see, that we use that expression to get across the idea that it's something more than just, you know, a thought process, if you will. And so, uh, but these words have been researched for several decades by my wife, and it's led to the trilogy of books that uh, the way of agape, what it means. See, we use these terms without precision normally. But if you want the practical results of over 20 years' research in these very questions, there's a, a trilogy, three books that published uh, about our personal relationship with God that deals with this very issue. That's the first commandment. He, but Jesus uh, uh, gives them um, a second supplement here. He says, and second is like, namely, this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these, these two things. Loving God first, loving your neighbor second. That covers them all. 
He's quoting, of course, Leviticus 19.18. And that's why in Romans 13, Paul can say, love is the fulfilling of the law. And we do not live by rules, you and I. We live by relationships. Big difference. The rules were nailed to a cross, a wooden cross in Judea some 2,000 years ago. And the scribe said to him, Well, Master, thou hast said the truth, for there is one God, and there is none other but he. See, the scribe dared co to commend the reply. The word apparently had spoken to his heart. And to love them with all thy heart, with all thy understanding, and with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and to love his neighbor as himself is more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. See, even in the Old Testament, it may surprise you to discover that in the Old Testament it teaches that there are some things more important than offering sacrifice and keeping laws. There's a whole family of these, but most clearly Micah chapter 6, verses 6 through 8. That can, that's a very key verse. It's inscribed in many people's living rooms on a plaque of some kind. What does the Lord require of thee? To love mercy and so forth. You check it out. Micah my, my, my 6, 6 to 8. And when Jesus saw that he answered discreetly, he said to him, Thou art not far from the kingdom of God. Whoa! Still wasn't there. But he was close. That verse changed some lives I'll come to in a minute. Anyway, when he said, Thou art not from the kingdom of God, and no man after that durst ask him any question. <laughs> You'd think they'd learn their lesson, wouldn't you? That's a tantalizing statement. Thou art not far from the kingdom of God. You can be close. But that only counts in hand grenades and horseshoes, right? <laughs> to be close doesn't count, does it? And this is eternity that we're talking about. Within an inch of heaven, yet on the way to hell, is that possible? See, he, this guy was informed, this inquirer, he was honest, he was not a coward, but still not in the kingdom, apparently. Really? I'd like to talk to you about a guy by the name of John Wesley. You've all heard his name, I'm sure. His coming to faith is one of the most important events in the Western world. Wow. He was born in 1703, the 15th child of Samuel and Susanna Wesley. He had a sound upbringing under an unusually talented mother. He went on to a brilliant career at Charterhouse and Oxford. He was an elected fellow of the Lincoln College in 1726. He served as a double professor of Greek and logic and not saved yet. Didn't realize that. He was ordained as a priest in the Church of England in 1728. Quite a resume so far, right? He met regularly for prayer, the study of Greek New Testament, and devotional exercises. He fasted twice a week. He visited prisons, assisted the poor and the sick. Are you impressed so far? In 1735, he accepted an invitation to become a missionary to the American Indians in Georgia. That's surprising, huh? Didn't know that, huh? It was a fiasco, by the way. All kinds of conflicts. He almost died from disease. And he was still unsaved. Is that possible? Think about this now. Aboard the ship on his return, he met some German Moravian Christians, which had a profound effect on him. And upon his return to London, he sought out one of their leaders. And through a series of conversations, Wesley, in his own words, says he was clearly, quote, clearly convinced of unbelief of the want of that faith whereby alone we are saved, close quote. His words. I'm not, I'm not imputing him here. He's, I'm quoting his own perceptions here. On the morning of May 24th, 1738, ten years after he'd been ordained, by the way, he opened his Bible haphazardly, and his eyes fell on Mark 12, 34. Thou art not far. 
from the kingdom of God. And that verse would become his life verse. That shook him to the core. Quote, In the evening I went by unwillingly to a society at Aldersgate uh, Street where one was reading Luther's preface to the Epistle to the Romans. About a quarter before nine, while he was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation. And an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. And uh, so, from then on, Wesley became a dynamo. He preached in churches, in mines, in fields, on horseback. He preached 42,000 sermons, averaged 4,500 miles a year, and those were different travel years. 60 to 70 miles per day, three sermons a day. The church has never been the same. The Lord conversing with a lost clergyman of the house of Israel bore parallels to Wesley's own lostness. Both were clergymen. Both were highly educated. He was talking to a scribe, and Jesus was, right? Both were highly educated. Both were scholars who knew their scriptures inside and out. Both were not far from the kingdom when confronted with Christ. See the parallel between the scribe and Wesley, of all people, and maybe ourselves. It's possible to have studied theology and have never become a true Christian. You can hear of the grace of Christ preached all your life and still be resting on your own goodness. And Jesus answered and said in verse 35, while he taught in the temple, How say the scribes that Christ is the son of David? Oh, I love this one. In Matthew 22, he says, What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? Is the way that it's posed there. This is the key question at Caesarea Philippi. Remember? Whom do you say I am? It's the most important question in our life. If we're wrong in this one, nothing else matters. The Jews believed that Messiah had, been a, had to be a physical de descendant of David. And that's all through, the, of course, the Old Testament. Jesus says that. For David himself said by the Holy Ghost, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. Jesus is quoting the first verse of Psalm 110 here. And that he's quoting Psalm 110, verse 1, and the key phrase is, My Lord. If you look at the Hebrew of that, if you look at Psalm 110, I got it in the English on the top, but the lower, going from right to left, is the Hebrew. And the word uh, 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 yod heh is, uh, and then you have the word Adonai. But the key to this, the whole issue, is this little yod. Looks like apostrophe. That little yod after the Adonai makes it possessive. The Lord said unto my Lord. See, it's the possessive thing. It's all because of that yod. And because of that, you put the lawyers to confusion. They could not figure out how that could be possible. They know the Messiah is to be the son of David, and yet here David calls him my Lord. How can he? And they couldn't deal with that. Way back in Matthew 5, I want to remind you, Jesus said, Think not that I come to destroy the law or the prophets. I come not to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, Till heaven and earth pass, one yacht or one tittle shall no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. And this is a yacht or a tittle. A yacht is this little tiny mark, the smallest of the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. A tittle is the little hooks on some of the letters. So he, that is where, having said that, then Jesus says, David therefore himself calleth him Lord. And whence is he then his son? And the, here it says, and the common people heard him gladly. I like the way it says it in Matthew. It says, they didn't dare ask him any more questions. <laughs> See, his whole argument hangs on a yacht. And I think that's, that, that's a call to taking the, the, taking the text seriously. Jesus took the psalm so literally, he took a yacht as the whole argument hung on it, if you will. No paraphrases here. Matthew records that and no man was able to answer him a word, neither durst any man from that day forth ask him any more questions. I love that. I love that. Verse 46 of Matthew 22. Okay. The Jews believed that Messiah would be David's son, 
But only, the only way David's son could also be David's Lord would be for, if the Messiah were God come in the human flesh. So this is actually a testimony to the virgin birth here too. So the answer, of course, is the miraculous virgin birth and all the, that accompanies it. And of course, before this week is over, the son of David would die in fulfillment of the Old Testament scriptures in Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53, and would be resurrected. The resurrection is the validation of the whole package. Concerning the Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which is made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and had declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of Holiness by the resurrection from the dead, according to the book of Romans. Verses, uh, chapter 1, three, verse 3 and 4, and confirmed in, by Paul also in 2 Timothy. See, the church easily falls captive to the culture. So this section of the scripture closes now with two warnings. First is against the pride of the scribes, verses 38 to 50, 40, that is, and against the pride of the rich. Two kinds of pride hazards forthcoming of the scribes and of the rich. Let's look at verse 38 to 40. And he said to them in, this, in his doctrine, Beware of the scribes which love to go in long clothing and love salutations in the marketplaces and the chief seats in the synagogues and the uttermost, uppermost rooms at feasts, which devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers, they shall receive greater damnation. That's heavy stuff. It's the character that counts, not the credentials or the other appurtenances. And the other, th another thing here is the, the role of money. Money reveals where your treasure is; there your heart will be also. Jesus reminds us in the uh, in the uh, Sermon on the Mount. Money reveals the state of the heart, as few other things can. There's nothing wrong with being rich. The danger is you may worship the riches. If you know anything about major entrepreneurs, you know that they regard money as just a means to get something done. And it is a way of keeping score. But you don't worship the money. Some do. But that's the hazard you guard against. Jesus sat over against the treasury and beheld how people cast money into the treasury. And many that were rich cast in much. Okay? He's beholding us right now. I love that uh, little boy asks his granddad, Does God see me all the time? Is he always watching? The grandfather says, he loves you so much he can't take his eyes off you. <laughs> I love that answer. All of us are before an audience all the time. An audience of one. We need to remember that. Some people say character is what you do, what you are when nobody's looking. <laughs> well, there's always somebody looking. There were 13 trumpet-shaped chests around the court of women where the people deposit their offerings. Court of women was a location in, in, the, in the temple. And that where they had these 13 trumpet-shaped kind of chests. And uh, that's where people deposited it. And there came a certain poor widow, and she threw in two mites, which make a farthing. Two, mite is even smaller than a farthing. There's two of them make a farthing. What is a mite? They're so small, they're called leptons. Uh, and literally, a peeled off or a fine. A, t a really tiny, thin coin. One four hundredth of a shekel. Roughly, in our parlance, probably about an eighth of a cent. Okay. Now, not only is it tiny, she could have put in half that. She put in both. You follow me? Interesting. Two lepta were her day's earnings, a considerable sum to her. A farthing is the smallest Roman coin or the smallest Greek imperial coin, and you would get into a whole lot of discussion about the coins, and I, I deleted that because we don't have to get into all that here. And he called unto him his disciples, and saith unto them, Verily I say unto you that this poor widow hath cast more in than all they which have cast into the treasury. Why? Because it was all she had. All that she had. It was proportion, not portions. 
For all they did cast in of their abundance, but she of her want did cast in all that she had, even all her living. And it wasn't that that was all she had. She had two of them. She could have kept one and put one in, and been, that would have been commendable. No, she put in both. There's a volitional aspect. If you had only two, you've got to give one okay, I'll give one. No, she gave in both. Interesting. She could have retained one of them. She gave everything. Of course, remember, let's remember 1 Corinthians 13, 3. Though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, and have not love, it profits me nothing. But I want to talk to you about the cirrhosis of the giver. The word cirrhosis, of course, is a progressive disease of the liver. It's characterized by an excessive formation of connective tissue, followed by a hardening and contraction, which results from unknown toxema, deficiencies, or parasites. That's what cirrhosis of the liver is. But I want to talk to you about cirrhosis of, <laughs> of the giver. I got this out. I can't use I had to include it. He says, <laughs> I can't do this with a straight face. <laughs> he says it was actually discovered about 34 AD and ran a terminal course in a couple named Ananias and Sapphira in Acts 5. It's an acute condition which, re <laughs> which renders the patient's hand immobile when it attempts to move from the billfold to the offering plate. <laughs> the remedy is... <laughs> the remedy is to remove the afflicted from the house of God, since it is clinically observable that this condition disappears in, a, in, in alternative environments, such as golf courses, clubs, or restaurants. <laughs> <laughs> I cracked up, so I had to include the slides. That's basically my procedure, I think, you know, is I try to glean from a lot of commentary. I steal, I steal a little from... If you steal from one guy, it's plagiarism. You steal from more than one, it's called research. You know? <laughs> but every once in a while, I come across something that is so uh, unique, I had to not only include it, but acknowledge it. Our Kent Hughes' commentary was, disease is not a motor problem, it's a heart problem. The best remedy is to fall in love with your God with all your heart, for where your heart is, there will your treasure be also. And that's Matthew 6, 21, re reversed. I flipped the bit around. I'd like to close this little study. We started with the first seven verses of Isaiah 5. And as I travel across the country, I would people say, where's, you know, they think, where's the United States in prophecy? And I don't think it appears in prophecy in, this, in the literal sense. But when they press me, I say, oh yeah, it's in the United States, and it's in Isaiah chapter 5. Okay, but I'm just going to start at verse 8. Okay, and I think it's, it lets you judge for yourself here. I, after that first seven verses, which we looked before about the vineyard and so forth, Isaiah says, Woe unto them that join house to house, that lay field to field, till there be no place that they, or ye, uh, may be placed alone in the midst of the earth. In other words, think of urban sprawl, sprawl, you know, sprawl here. In my ear, said the Lord of hosts, of a truth, many houses shall be desolate, even great and fair, without inhabitant. Yea, ten acres of vineyard shall yield one bath, and the seed of an omer will yield an ephah. Very unproductive. Woe unto them that join house to house. Call that materialism. Woe unto them that rise up early in the morning, that they may follow strong drink, and continue until night, till wine inflame them. All they do is drink all night. Woe unto them. And the harp, and the vial, and the tabard, the pipe, uh, and the harp... Uh, and pipe and wine are in their feasts, but they regard not the work of the Lord, neither consider the operation of His hands. Therefore my people are gone into captivity because they have no knowledge, and their honorable men are famished, and their multitude dried up with thirst. Therefore hell hath enlarged herself, and opened her mouth without measure, and their glory, and their multitude, and their pomp, and he that rejoiceth shall descend un into it. And the mean man shall be brought down, and the mighty man shall be humbled, and the eyes of the lofty shall be humbled. But the Lord of hosts shall be exalted in judgment, and the God that is holy shall be sanctified in righteousness. Then shall the lambs feed after their manner, and the waste places of the fat ones shall the strangers eat. Woe unto them! Now this is the one that really gets to me. Woe unto them that draw iniquity with cords of vanity, and their sin, as it were, with a cart rope. 
In other words, they not only sin, they parade it in parades to celebrate their sin. Every time I think of a gay pride parade, I think of this verse, Isaiah 5.18, Woe unto them that draw iniquity with cords of vanity, and their sin, as it were, with a cart rope. That say, let him make speed and hasten his work, that we may see it. Let the counsel of the Holy One of Israel draw nigh and come, that we may know it. That's a taunt. That's a taunt. Woe unto them that call evil good, and good evil that put darkness for light, and light for darkness that put bitter for sweet, and sweet for bitter. Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes, and prudent in their own sight. Woe unto them that are mighty to drink wine, men of strength, and to mingle strong drink, which justify the wicked for reward, and take away the righteousness of the righteous, righteousness of the righteous from him. There are six woes in, the, in Isaiah, and I think those six woes describe the predicament that we are in in America. And I think God's abandonment judgment has begun. That's what I think the, resu that's what the result is here, and that's what I think. Therefore, as the fire devoureth the stubble, and the flame consumeth the chaff, so their root shall be as rottenness, and their blossom shall go up as dust, because they have cast away the law of the Lord of hosts, and despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. Therefore is the anger of the Lord kindled against his people. And hath stretched forth his hand against them, and hath smitten them, and the hills did tremble, and their carcasses were torn, uh, dung in the midst of the streets. For all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. And he will lift up an ensign for the nations from far, and he will hiss unto them from the end of the earth, and behold, they shall come with speed swiftly. And none shall be weary, nor stumble among them, none shall slumber nor sleep, neither shall the girdle of their loins be loosed, nor the latchet of their shoes be broken whose arrows are sharp, their, all their bows bent, their horses' hooves shall be counted like flint, and their wheels like a whirlwind, their roaring shall be like a lion, they shall roar like young lions, yea, they shall roar, and lay hold of the prey, and shall carry it away safe, and none shall deliver it. And in that day shall they shall roar against them like the roaring of the sea, and if one look into the land, behold, darkness and sorrow, and the light is darkened in the heavens thereof. Heavy stuff. I think it obviously was written in direction of Israel, but I think it also may uh, be an illusion of the predicament that we've chosen in our own country. Well, for our next session, we're going to talk about the farewell prophecy called the Olivet Discourse. And uh, I want you to read for our next session Matthew 24 and its equivalent in Mark 13. They're both quite parallel with only one subtle difference between them, which we'll talk about. But I also would like you to take the time, if you have the time to do it, is contrast that, the, that passage, either one of them, Matthew 24 or Mark 15, with Luke 21. Many people think that Luke 21 is also the Olivet Discourse, but if you study it carefully, you'll discover it's not. Very similar, slightly different audience, slightly different emphasis, profoundly different conclusions. So I encourage you to contrast Luke 21. Do not regard it as part of the Olivet Discourse. It's a very similar yet distinctively different passage. Uh, get ready for next session. And with that, let's stand for a closing word of prayer.